test is called the Lachman test. And to do that, you, um, you need to support the patient's thigh. And so for people that have small hands, or if it's a particularly large person who has a large thigh, this might be difficult. You want to encircle the, partly encircle the thigh with your hand, uh, just above the knee to support it, and bend it to about 20 to 30 degrees. Then you want to grasp the, around the, the, the lower leg, around the tibia. You want to try to pull the tibia anteriorly to see if there's any laxity in the knee joint. And there will typically be a little bit of motion there, but there should be a good firm endpoint. Um, and he has a normal exam here. And again, you'd want to compare that to the other side. The other test, which might be easier for some folks, particularly if they have a very large um, leg, is to, it's, it's called the anterior and posterior drawer test. And you can bend the leg to 45 to 90 degrees. And then most folks actually just kind of sit on the, uh, kind of uh, stabilize the foot by sitting on it. I'm just going to sit right here. Mm -hmm. Let me know if anything's painful. Okay. And you grab both hands around the leg, around the tibia, and you want to pull anteriorly, checking the anterior crucial ligament, and also push posteriorly to check the posterior crucial ligament. Again, you're looking for any pain or laxity of motion here, and this is a normal exam. And again, to compare to the other side is important. The final exam we'll do is called the McMurray test. That's a test for a meniscal injury. Um, and to do that test, you need to, you're looking for an ability to extend the, extend the leg at the knee or any pain or popping when you do this maneuver. And to do the maneuver, you need to encircle the anterior part of the knee. So your palm needs to go over the kneecap and your, either your index or your middle finger and your thumb have to go over both the medial and lateral joint lines here. And I'm going to bend your knee up all the way. And you want, to rot you want to turn the lower leg, you want to turn the foot medially, and then extend the knee, looking for any pop or crepitus. Any trouble there? No. Okay. And then you want to rotate the foot laterally and do the same maneuver, just extend the leg, feeling for any crepitus or pop here. Okay, good. So, good knees, Bill. Thank you. Okay. So again, we've uh, examined both the hip, the knee, and the ankle by inspection, palpation, and then uh, passive range of motion, although you'd also want to include active range of motion in a musculoskeletal exam. We also did some special maneuvers to look at ways to assess for knee injury. I'd just like to thank Bill for uh, helping out today. Sure. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Gazer in the Department of Family Medicine. Today we're going to be talking about the lower extremity exam. Uh, I'll be demonstrating uh, to how, we ins how you inspect the lower extremity, how you palpate, and then perform passive range of motion of both the hip, knee, and ankle. And we'll come back and look at some special maneuvers that look at the knee exam for people that have an injured knee. Uh, we won't be doing active range of motion today, so that would normally we'd normally be doing that after palpation before passive range of motion, and we're going to just want to make a note that we will be skipping the active range of motion in this demonstration. Uh, helping me demonstrate today is Mr. Bill Garant, and thanks for coming back, Bill. We've seen Bill before here. And uh, initially, it, like, as with any type of musculoskeletal exam, with inspection, you're looking for things like uh, deformity, um, swelling, changes in coloration when people are walking, changes in gait. We're going to start with inspecting the hip, and Bill, I'm just going to ask you to pick up your gown so we can get a, get a look at your iliac crests. I'm just going to locate the iliac crests here on either side of his uh, lower abdomen, and, and that just gives me a sense that, um, that, that he has some symmetry here uh, with his pelvis, and his legs are probably about the same length, that there's no obvious sort of muscular, uh, neuromuscular disease that would cause one side to be weak and perhaps uh, lower than the other side. Next, I'm going to take a look at his knees, and we're going to be looking for any sort of deformity, and commonly with, with, with uh, people you may see a knock knee deformity or what's called a, a geno, genu valgus deformity where the knees are closer together, or a geno virus deformity or bow-legged deformity where the knees are further apart, and, and Bill has a uh, fairly normal looking, normal look. And then once you go ahead and have a seat up here and we'll go ahead and look at the rest of the hip. Okay. Yeah, if you would go ahead and lie back please. And Okay. 
Um, and, and please let me know if anything is sore sure. or uncomfortable as we do this. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull your gown up a little bit if that's okay. Yeah. I'm just going to palpate um, about the pelvis for instability just to be sure there's no pain. So I'm just going to place both hands over the iliac crest and just rock a little bit if there's any pain or anything there. Bill, let me know. No. Yeah. It's going to palpate over the greater trochanter, which is located on the lateral aspect of the thigh, and it's the large bony prominence. See if there's any tenderness there. And is that uh, no, sore at all, Bill? Okay, no. good. Now we're going to go ahead and look at the range of motion of the hip. We're first going to look at flexion. I'm just going to, I'm going to flex your hip up and then bend your knee. And try to, we're going to try to flex this as far up in the abdomen as you can. And you should normally get about 130 degrees of flexion here at the hip. And have you straighten your leg out. And then pick your leg up with the knee extended. And then you should normally get about close to 90 degrees of flexion here. And Bill's got good loose hamstrings, so he's uh, pretty limber. Um, now we're going to go ahead and check for internal and external rotation. So I'm going to bend your hip and bend your knee to about 90 degrees. I'm going to internally rotate the leg. And sort of paradoxically, when you internally rotate the leg, the foot goes to the outside. When I externally rotate the hip, now the foot's going to go to the inside. Okay, any soreness or pain yeah. there? Sorry. Okay, good. So I'm going to uh, abduct or abduct the leg at the hip. So I'm going to pull the the, uh, the hip away from the midline. Okay. I'm going to adduct the hip and pull it towards the across his body until the pelvis starts to come up off the other off the table. And he's just starting to rotate now, so we'll stop there. Okay. I'm not going to go ahead and take a look at extension of the hip while he's standing. This is a fairly easy way to do that. So, Bill, if you could just move to the table and uh, oh, um, I'll hold it up for you. Okay. If you could just sort of support yourself here sure. so we don't lose your balance. And try to stand up straight. I'm just going to reach down and um, support your leg. And I'm just going to extend this back. And you would ex expect this to extend back about 20 or 30 degrees. Um, thanks. Well, you can also do that in the, in the prone position. And we're going to go ahead and uh, first just inspect the knee looking at the patella at the bony landmarks, at the, both at the, uh, the normal concavities on either side of the patella and below. I'm going to come back and look at the knee now to say if uh, Mr. Grant was presenting with a painful knee. And we sort of look, take a look at the knee a little more closely. First, we'll just, again, look at the knee um, and then palpate it. And we'll both we'll, uh, palpate the patella for any tenderness or discomfort. I'm going to palpate the lateral joint line at the tibiofemoral joint. Again, looking for any pain or um, bony abnormality. Then also in the medial aspect of that joint. I want to palpate the tibial tuberosity. And then the, uh, post, then the uh, popliteal space behind the knee. And there aren't any abnormalities there. Then we go ahead and check the range of motion of the knee, first by just extending the knee. And most people can get their knees to close to 160 degrees here. And then extend the knee. And most people can at least get their knees to a neutral position, zero. And many people have a little bit of hyperextension. Up to 15 degrees is normal. And we'll just has a little bit of hyperextension at his knee here. OK. Now, some people in the injury might have an effusion in the knee, and I'm going to do a couple of tests now to assess if, to see if there were, was any fluid in, in Bill's knee. I'm going to put one hand over the suprapatellar pouch, and because the, the knee um, joint space actually extends up above the patella um, into, this, into, the distal, into the distal leg, and that's called the suprapatellar pouch. And this test is called Belotman. I'm just going to tap on his kneecap or his patella to see if I can drive it back into his femoral condyles. And really, there's really not much give there. And when I let go, if there were an effusion, there'd feel, you'd feel a little bit of a bounce coming back, and there's not. So he doesn't really have any effusion. The other test for effusion is, is called the um, bulge sign. And the way you do that is you uh, stroke the medial aspect of the knee between the patella and the femoral condyle, and you try to push the fluid up into the super, super patellar pouch. So I'm just going to firmly push a few times to try to milk any fluid that might be present from the medial aspect of the knee up into the suprapatellar pouch. And I'm just going to take my other hand and push on the lateral aspect of the knee between the patella and the femoral 
condyle and or the epicondyle and just see if there's a bulge on the other side on the medial aspect of the knee and there's not so he uh, doesn't have any fluid in his knee.